what I'm trying to do is grab weddings from the, the panoply of rituals that the court spent a great deal of time organizing and thinking about and choreographing and bring that into the discussion of ritual and power in general. What we do then today is talk really about these four um, moments in about two and a half centuries of Russian history, really from about 1500 to about 1750, 1745, uh, which is the, the, the span of period that, uh, the span of time that I'm mostly interested in this book coming up. I want to talk about royal weddings as ritual events. I want to talk about power, piety, and then finish up with a few words on dynasty. And in the course of this, we'll be looking at uh, the relationship between uh, uh, meaning and symbol as they are found in these weddings, but also um, uh, the role of religious belief, uh, particularly of Tsar Alexei Mikhailovich in uh, the way weddings were performed in this period. And finally, uh, really about succession, about how, uh, it's my argument, really the major argument of this re most recent book, that uh, weddings were about dynasty. And dynasty and wedding come together specifically about, uh, about succession. So here you have uh, sort of a little schema, uh, schematic diagram that I put together for you. On the way weddings were organized in the 16th century, I have another one for the 17th century in a moment. And uh, basically what you see here is a wedding that is really actually a set of rituals, not just a simple um, crowning or betrothal, betrothal crowning service, but actually that's at the, uh, at the core of accomplishing a marriage, but actually it's surrounded by a number of other rituals that were essential. So when you look at the beginning, I hope you can see my cursor, when you look at the beginning of uh, the process of marrying a czar, or any member really of the dynasty, there are a number of uh, preliminary uh, rituals. The first, of course, the bride show, which was um, a topic of my first book, uh, is, a, is literally a bride show. It is a gathering of eligible young women um, from across Russia in front of the czar, and he gets to pick which one he is going to marry. Of course, that's a that is a um, that is a view that uh, there's an example of uh, painting by Sidov of what he imagines one looked like. That's of course a very fanciful uh, view of what a bride show was because in fact these were highly choreographed, highly rigged uh, moments when uh, the, the candidates were were of course evaluated before they ever met the czar. The list of candidates was was vetted by boyars the greatest noble families in the court and their wives um, in order to, to, to identify candidates that would not uh, disturb by their being selected and by their relatives coming in on their coattails, uh, the already existing balance of forces inside the court. Bride shows. Uh, once a bride was selected, she would be then ritually entered into the tarim, which was the the female apartments uh, inside the Kremlin, uh, usually with her female folk kin and uh, also her male kin who would become, uh, perhaps not that day, but very soon would become boyars themselves. And then a very interesting third preliminary ritual, which was the renaming and retitling of the bride. The bride show was introduced uh, at the same time that a new marriage custom was introduced in Russia, which is the, um, the abjuring of women of uh, royal ancestry, uh, whether they be foreigners or princesses from other principalities within the Russian, uh, Northeast Russian space, to uh, women of uh, middling aristocratic, really gentry background. Uh, and a number of rituals, including giving her a new name and giving her the title Tsarevna, which means daughter of a tsar, princess, if you like, uh, fictive titles and new names were given to the brides as a way of kind of, I've argued, I've argued as a way of kind of evening the match, uh, as a kind of fictively um, raising the status of the, of the bride to that uh, worthy of the Tsar, and also giving her a new identity, usually a first, first name. There are these other, um, and by the way, those are the book covers that you can, this is the first 
plug that you can, um, you'll find today. Uh, the first book here talks about those bride shows and this is my forthcoming book. Don't worry, you'll see that slide again. Um, the, once the bride had been entered into the tarim, given a new name and title, uh, the wedding would happen usually three days later. That changes a little bit in the 17th century, but usually three days later. And there you can see sort of the basic elements of the three days of a traditional 16th century Muscovite royal wedding. The, the groom would go to the first hierarchy and seek a blessing to wed. That would be usually in the morning of the wedding day. There would then, uh, everyone would then gather in a banquet hall, one of the um, larger uh, venues inside the Kremlin, where there would be a betrothal service and later the banquet. The, ba the betrothal service would take place there, not in the church as you probably know today. The betrothal and the crowning service are now typically linked. Uh, in the 16th century, they were separate um, very commonly. In the 17th century, that begins, that, that linking of them begins. Uh, the service would take place in the Dormition Cathedral immediately afterwards. Uh, and then after the wedding, the bride would go off and um, uh, be with the women of the court and the, the groom would go on a small mini pilgrimage to the uh, churches and monasteries inside the, the uh, Kremlin where he would ha hear a padihida uh, to uh, his ancestors. Right, the Tsars who were buried in that church, and uh, this would not be actually the, the, the church where they were buried, was the Archangel Michael Cathedral, right next to the Dormition Cathedral, right there in Palace um, Cathedral Square inside the Kremlin. And there would be a service to the ancestors, then there would be some rest time, and then a banquet at the end. Toward the end of the banquet, the couple would be escorted out, and there would be um, an opportunity for the banquet to continue while the the marriage was being consummated. The second day would begin with nuptial baths, ritual baths to, for practical reasons, but also ritual purity reasons, washing off uh, 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 the events of the previous night and uh, breakfast usually with kasha and then uh, gift exchanges. And then that evening, uh, another banquet. Interestingly, after the banquet, the bride and groom would go off to separate places. They wouldn't sleep together the second night. The bride would sleep with the other women of the court. The, gr the groom would sleep with the uh, men of the court in his own bedroom. Uh, there was a, an effort to sort of help integrate the new couple into their surroundings, particularly, of course, the bride. Then the third day would be uh, a number of uh, audiences with the church, with church hierarchs and uh, merchants and, again, gift exchanges. Now you can see how it changes in the 17th century. Uh, basically, we had a fourth day, with uh, the which is devoted particularly to the um, to audiences with the uh, church hierarchs and gift exchanges as well with them. So what we have here is you can notice a kind of uh, uh, blending, you might say, of a traditional Orthodox Christian liturgical. Uh, happenings alongside what we might call a number of um, um, earthy and uh, we might even say pre-Christian uh, traditions. As we're going to discuss in a moment, um, in the 16th century, it was not remarkable for the Muscovites to see the bride and groom twice uh, showered with hops, a symbol of fertility. It wasn't disturbing at all to anyone to put sheaths of grain underneath their bed. It wasn't remarkable at all in any way for arrows to be placed in the four corners of the bridal chamber, along with uh, other uh, bowls of grain, uh, usually wheat and uh, uh, little bowls of honey as well, all symbols of fertility and prosperity. Uh, these were not um, in any way, no indication at all that these pre-Christian habits were in any way problematical to, to Muscovites of the time. This will change as we'll see in the 17th century, but in the 16th century, uh, not so much. The second thing I want to really uh, talk about, the, the real meat of this, is uh, the, um, the way weddings and power uh, overlapped. How a royal wedding was, yes, a sacrament of the church, 
in a key moment in the life of any individual, certainly the bride and groom, but also their families, whether it be the dynasty or the gentry family from which the, the, the bride was, was drawn. But it was also a moment of opportunity. In the 16th century, of course, you have a dynasty that has been on the throne since really, uh, technically, really only since Daniel Moskovsky, Saint, Saint Daniel of Moscow, but going really all the way back to Saint Vladimir and fictively back to Rurik. Uh, but in the 17th century, of course, we have a new dynasty that has links to the old dynasty. And one of the things that uh, th this new dynasty, the House of Romanov, is going to be very keen to do, and I argue is quite expert at doing, brilliant at doing, was, was uh, exploiting, manipulating, uh, making use of the panoply of tools at its disposal to uh, announce itself as the continuation of the old dynasty, which it saw itself as. Uh, the use of architecture and art, the use of uh, uh, commemorations in church services, but also uh, coronations and, of course, now weddings. Our first major change that we can see in the evolution of that, that, that uh, uh, system of rituals that we call Muscovite weddings, royal weddings, begins really in 1624 and 1626, when the first Romanov czar, Michael Fyodorovich, finally marries. And what I want to argue here is that the, uh, the moment in 1624, when the first czar marries, Romanov czar marries, was a unique moment in the history of, uh, in the history of really uh, document generation and production. It was, a, it was a, an event. Uh, it was a, 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 a literary, you might say, opportunity there are documents, of course, that were generated by all these weddings. And I've had the pleasure of looking at them all and publishing some of them. Two stand out as the most important. The first is the wedding muster, the Razdred, which was a simple list of everybody who did anything at the wedding. Because a wedding had an, an enormous number of, of servitors at it. In fact, the goal was to bring as many people in from the court uh, into the celebrations as possible as a way of sort of buy-in. And so you can see all these, uh, these positions, these ranks that were used, uh, thousands man, thousand man uh, proxy parents, um, best men who were usually two matchmakers who were usually their wives and so on. Uh, the muster listed these people in a hierarchical fashion from the most important, which would be the Tisitsky, the thousand men, all the way down to the holders of loaves of bread and grain. That source begins already in 1500. We have the very first document in 1500 um, with uh, the, the wedding of the daughter of uh, Ivan III. In 1626, we have the very first chin or ceremonial, if you like. This is actually a narrative description of what happens. So the names that were in the muster were sort of plugged in to the descriptions of the rituals that were being performed for the wedding. And the, the, uh, the, both the muster and the ceremonial uh, included all four, three or four days, sometimes more, of the events. Strangely, they omit the bride show, which I've never really quite understood why. Uh, bride shows are not there. The entry into the, um, uh, into the tarim isn't there. Um, the renaming sometimes is there, uh, but generally those preliminary rituals are sort of uh, described differently and in different kinds of sources. The ceremonial and the mustard have to do really with the wedding itself. And there you can see the, in this image, you can see these scribes uh, working on these documents, producing edits, edits of them, because every time a new are married, even if the, uh, the underlying ritual stayed the same, and in the 16th century it did, you still had to plug in new names, which meant that you had to bring in everybody who was literate and could write and uh, start all over, write the documents anew. And then they would be edited because some names would have to be taken in or out because someone got sick, someone died, someone got Ivan the Terrible's wedding in 1547 to Anastasia Romanova. She, uh, one of the most prominent members of Drushka, a best man, fell off his horse and died 
we're told in the documents, right, to be replaced. So there's editing all the way up into the last minute. It's fascinating to look at, actually. What ha we have in 1624 with the first Tsar is a remarkable, unique moment. We have the machinery of, this, of the chancelleries put into operation like never before for any ritual that I've ever found. A unique moment of uh, copying old documents from the 16th century, taking excer uh, excerpts from them, editing the excerpts, putting them into worksheets, and then finally at the end, generating a new muster and a new uh, ceremonial for Michael Romanov's first wedding. Evidence of this copying work is in the copies themselves, many of which survive, but also in descriptions of, of uh, uh, the archive that kept these documents. Well, we know what once existed, it may not anymore, but also why they were written, because the archivists tell us. This is a remarkable moment of research into the past to make the first Romanov wedding, I would argue, as traditional as possible. This is a new dynasty who who's, has every interest and incentive to show itself to be, in fact, a continuation of the old dynasty. It needs to use every tool in its toolbox, and ritual is a key one. And here we have a moment when the uh, machinery uh, of the chancellery system is being put to this work. And you can see from this, this is a very complicated uh, document. I sort of just want you to see what was done. Here we have the, the wedding ceremony of 15, 20, 1626, and there's the 1624. It's lost. Here's a worksheet which comes from all of these excerpts and copies and all of this done from the 16th century originals. So we can actually, you can see the numbers here. Those are the archival addresses of these extant documents and sometimes even the folios of, of the little excerpts. And we can actually show how the copies were made, excerpts were drawn from them, how they were recopied into the worksheet and then made into the gene. It's actually a fairly unique moment of where we can actually see the, what you would call the, 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 um, the, 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 the editing machinery, the document generation work uh, actually uh, happening in front of our eyes. And I want to give you an example of that. Pretty interesting example, actually. This is that worksheet that I was talking about, one folio from it, okay? And here we have a question that's been written into this document. Uh, and it asks, um, concerning the betrothal um, and uh, where the betrothal is to take place, is it to take place um, in the banquet hall, Namiestia, or in the church? And the, the, it says, Pasmatrich v patrednikia, to look in the Book of Needs, the actual liturgical manual for how this is supposed to be done. And evidently, already by 1624, the, uh, the Slujednik already tells us that it's supposed to be in the church because the next line says that. And you can see that the scribe, whose name was Gramatin, who was a very important figure in the period and had terrible handwriting, um, scratches out the question and writes in his answer that, in fact, the weddings, the, the uh, abruchenia, the, the betrothal, will be in the church. It had been separate, as I said, in the 16th century. Lo and behold, on its own, not influenced by royal weddings, but on its own, that had been, mainly by church authorities, that had been pulled together into a single combined service, double service. Just if you get married in an Orthodox church, that's what you'll, that's what you'll experience today for the most part. Um, that was uh, a question mark still early in the 17th century. And here you see an example of how uh, they took material from the 16th century. They say, wait a minute, this, is, this document here is saying it's separate, but we don't do that anymore. How should we handle this? And Gramatin says, go take a look inside the Patrednik. We're going to do it that way. And they did. And they found that it was supposed to be together. And they wrote the note saying it's together. Right. And they took that note 
and they put it into the ceremonial and you can sort of again see how the question led to an answer, led to an edit, led to the final version that we have available. It's a fascinating process actually. A little bit of detective work to, to see it, but kind of fun. But it's not just um, these practical and liturgical matters that they were looking at. In fact, not primarily not that. They were looking at the way uh, 16th century weddings happened for the purpose of tweaking it in such a way that they could send certain, what I would argue, certain dynastic messages about power and dynastic continuity to those who were participating. The audience for this were the participants themselves. These, I so sort of hasten to remind you that these weddings were inside the Kremlin. Uh, they were not uh, broadcast on TV or the internet. The audience were the, the performers themselves, which was in a way all that really mattered, right? They were the ones that, uh, that needed to be told what the dynasty was. Um, the, the courtiers are the ones close to the throne that needed to know uh, what this new regime was going to be like and what it meant. What I have here is an example of a different kind of tweak. There's actually quite a lot of them and you might want to refer to my book uh, for all of them. Um, but here we have actually a very fascinating one. It has to do with that procession that many, many uh, pilgrimages I mentioned where the Tsar goes off and prays in front of his ancestors. Here's a wonderful image of that taken from uh, an illustrated manuscript of Michael Romanov's second wedding in 1626. You may remember that the crowning service, um, the procession rather to the, to the churches happened after the wedding, right? In the 16th century. So you got the blessing to wed, you went in wed, and then you went on this procession, just the men, um, and it was a smaller group. And you went to the monasteries and you prayed with a patihita probably uh, and um, got their blessing, prayed for them, sort of in a, a stamp of approval. And then you had the banquet. In the 17th century, we notice significantly that the procession has been moved to before the crowning. In fact, the procession becomes much larger, more attendance, but also it's, it becomes the very first public event, the first public rite of a, of a Muscovite wedding in the 17th century. So instead of being sort of uh, squished between the two major events of the first day, the, the wedding itself and the banquet, it's now picked up and plopped to the beginning of everything else. And let's remember that the, 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 uh, the ones that are being prayed for, the Panihita, and the document still says, uh, you know, Predkim, ancestors, were in fact not Romanov ancestors. Ivan the, Ivan the Terrible may have been married to a Romanov, but he wasn't himself a Romanov. Neither was Vasily III, neither was uh, Ivan III. So to have Michael Romanov and then his, the rest of his, uh, the Romanovs in the 17th century go on this mini pilgrimage to pray in front of their ancestors was itself a conviction designed to accentuate the links between the new dynasty and the old. In fact, to build the, to, to build the notion that this really was a single dynasty, right? The second or sort of thing that comes out of this revision work that we see happens with the second Tsar. And the second Tsar is of course, uh, uh, Alexei Mikhailovich, the, the only surviving son of the first Tsar, Mikhail Fyodorovich. We know him as a very pious man. Um, one of the interesting things about studying the, his wedding is how the cliche that he was Tishaishi, right, the most serene Tsar, and uh, the idea that he was uh, uh, ultra religious, attended long services without ever sitting. Um, has kind of entered lore in his, the historiography is something not to stop and think about. But the study of his weddings, and he married twice in 1648 and 1671, actually highlight that fact that he was in fact a deeply pious man because he 
it tinkers with the wedding ceremonies in ways that can only really, I think, be explained as an expression of his own personal piety. Moreover, a lot of the elements that have been introduced in 1624 and 26 for the first czar tend to be muted for the second czar. And I interpret that to mean that the Romanovs now find it less urgent a thing to do uh, to uh, emphasize their connections with the old dynasty because they're now two generations in. It's still, of course, uh, true that the dynasty has these links and they're important, but they're less emphasized in terms of the, the way the rituals play out. What, what he does uh, instead is focus on the religious elements of the um, of the wedding ceremonies. And here I go back to what we talked about before, that in the 17th century, these pre-Christian fertility rites that we can talk about, the use of the phallic arrows, um, honey, grains, hops, uh, and so on, which weren't really very much noticed, if at all, in the 16th century. By the 17th century, we have a very different religious environment, not just in Russia, but pretty much generally in Europe in the early modern period, 17th century, we have a very stiff uh, hardening of, of confessional lines where uh, uh, intermarriage is now a real question. Philaret, uh, the father of uh, the first Romanov and the grandfather of the second, um, was himself very strongly against intermarriage and very strongly against um, uh, conversion by chrismation alone, for example, he wanted them to be baptized. Uh, and there are other pieces of evidence that in the 17th century, Paul Bushkovich has written about this, uh, that there's a real genuine uh, hardening of confessional lines. And we see that again here in the weddings, because Alexei Mikhailovich, uh, very influenced by uh, the Zealots of Piety and other groups uh, that are uh, interested in sort of revising and reviving orthodox praxis and spirituality, um, looks at the wedding ceremonies. He does, he, he does it in two phases, his first and second weddings. And you can see from what I've written down, he's, he's go, he goes after the pre-Christian stuff. He gets rid of it. Uh, the nuptial candles that have been stuck in grains and set, grain being again a fertility symbol, these nuptial candles from the wedding service itself brought in and commingled with these grains are now taken back to the church and allowed to burn down. Uh, the sprinkling of hops at two moments in the service is eliminated and the arrows and the honey are all gone. Alexei Mikhailovich genuinely wanted this to be a, a, a Christian, a thoroughly Christian sacramental moment. I guess I would argue that it always was and that these elements only become important in his time as problematical, right? Uh, before that, um, as I say, Muscovites weren't really paying any attention to this. Um, there's this idea of Dvoyeveria, the idea that, that, uh, that, that there was a synth synthesis of non-Christian and Christian um, practices going on in Russia in lots of spheres, and we can see that in weddings too. I don't want to go too much into that except to say um, that there is a change, clearly a change in the 17th century. So in other words, these changes that we're seeing in the, in the religious content in the 17th century has to do both with the uh, spirit of the times, if you like, this hardening of confessional lines that we see across Europe in 17th century, mid 17th century, but also with his own personal um, belief system, which itself was you know, dependent on that and, and originates with that sort of spirit of the times. Um, the, uh, the wedding of uh, uh, Alexei Mikhailovich gives us other evidence though too, that dynasty was really important. And I wanna talk a bit about that next. So here you have, and I won't make you look at all of this in detail, but here you have three chunks of text. Uh, the first on the far left is the third prayer over the couple during the crowning ceremony. The one in the middle is taken from Patriarch Filaret's uh, speech to his son at the moment of the blessing to wed ritual on the first day. 
what you get on the third column is uh, Alexei Mikhailovich's third wedding, uh, excuse me, second wedding um, to uh, Peter the Great's mother, Natalia Naryshkina, in 1671. That uh, speech was given actually on the 14th day, it would have been moved uh, when the hierarchs came and gave him a blessing and exchanged gifts. So the 14th, that fourth day in the traditional 7th, 17th century wedding was extended out to 14 days later. In any case, this speech in 1671 and the one in 1626 derive very clearly textually from the liturgical service itself, which is itself something important to note, that this, the liturgical service itself was a source for extra liturgical texts that were uh, uttered at the wedding and incorporated in the later Qin as it was written down, the ceremonial as it was written down. But there were differences. If you take a look at the um, bold names on the left, you can see that there's a long list here, a shorter list here, and an even shorter list here. And if you sort of graph that, what you notice is that the Slujadnik is giving us the great um, uh, Old Testamental fathers, Abraham and Sarah, Isaac, Rebecca, Jacob, Rachel, who beget the 12 patriarchs, Joseph and Asenath, who give us Ephraim and Manasseh, Zechariah and Elizabeth, who give us the forerunner, and the root of Jesse that gives us the mother of God. And you can sort of see that from the root of Jesse according to the flesh and so on. What we get over in uh, 1626 is Philaret's edits of that list in his speech. We get the first three generations of the great biblical patriarchs, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, and Jacob. And then we skip all of the rest and new names are introduced. Elkanah and, and Anna and their son, the prophet Samuel. And then as the text says, other fathers pleasing, ancient fathers who pleased God, right? If we take a look at the third list, we see again Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and now their spouses. And we zip again over this list. We don't include this list, and we get two new names, David and Abigail, and Artaxerxes and Esther. Remarkable. How do we make sense of this list? Well, the thing about cultural history is that uh, sometimes you have to um, interpret uh, freely. I think what we have here is, is the base text because it comes from the liturgy and it's the text that the church wants us to emphasize. And when you think about it, we get the mother of God, we get the forerunner, we get the prophets, and then the first three, right? So we're rooted in uh, a, a, a genealogy that leads us to, to Christ. Uh, here, however, we stop and we get instead Elkanah and Anna Samuel and the other fathers. Samuel the, is the key figure here, I think, because he's the, he's the kingmaker. He's the guy who removes the blessing from Saul and gives it to David. And when you look at the text uh, of, the, of the speech, there's a, a clear um, notion of, of dynastic continuity and change going on here. To emphasize Samuel is to emphasize that God has blessed what has happened. And what has happened is that we have a new dynasty on the throne that has its roots in the old one. However, over here, we have something really strange going on. Um, in 1671, we have um, uh, this text from Abigail, and this is a snippet from my book, but just to sort of um, uh, have you look at this particular line, check out here where from uh, 1 Samuel 25, 10, to explain why Abigail might be the, the and not Bathsheba, might be the, the wife of David that's included here. If you look at who Abigail was, you find again a dynastic link in the biblical texts. Uh, so we see her saying, um, the whole deal with her previous husband Nabal and how she intercedes to save his life even though Nabal has treated David very poorly. And then she uh, says to him, please forgive your servant for any offense I have given you, for Yahweh will certainly assure you of a lasting dynasty. Since you are fighting Yahweh's battles and no fault has been found in you throughout your life. This is Abigail imploring David 
to, um, to spare her, her wretched husband's life. Uh, and at the same time, making a, a prophetic prediction about David's progeny uh, being a, a firm lasting dynasty. When you look at um, the uh, speech in 1671, you find um, a clear reference, I think, to the Bride Show, because Natalia, uh, Natalia uh, Narishkina had been picked by in a Bride Show. She had become the archetypical royal bride. She's described that way in the speech. And I guess I would also point out that the very first play, which was being um, quickly, shortly after the wedding be pulled together, and performed in 1672, very first play in Russia, secular play in Russia, was a um, Esther story. And the comedy of Artax Artaxerxes um, sort of trumpets uh, Natalia for her virtue, her wisdom, her modesty, and her lack of ambition. Uh, all sort of quintessential um, uh, virtues for a proper bride, chosen by a bride show. Right? And the bride shows the first two acts of this play, a five act play. So to go back then to this, what I'm thinking, uh, what I'm thinking here when I see this list is a, a, a base text that is being adapted for purposes of dynasty, for purposes of explaining and broadcasting a message that the dynasty wants to say about itself to the most important audience it has, which is to say servitors. And again, here's another plug. You can find more there. So I want to end then uh, talking more than about succession. And I'm almost done, but I, I really do think that the story isn't just about weddings. Weddings, of course, are dynastic moments when you're a czar. Weddings provide for the birth of legitimate children, children who can also be heirs. And so when we're looking at weddings, where we're studying Muscovite weddings, we're really studying the succession system. We're really talking about the dynasty. There are, of course, many other ways that you can uh, approach uh, the uh, study of weddings. There are certainly the, the, the way anthropologists have done it in terms of the rites themselves. You can look at it liturgically, um, Politics is my thing, and these texts really just shout at me uh, for the political content. So what I want to point out here is how, it, as the wedding ritual changes, uh, the underlying dynastic message remains the same, because things do change. Uh, Alexei Mikhailovich's second wedding in 1671 really is the last, one can say, full-blown Muscovite wedding. Um, that we have. His uh, three sons, uh, Fyodor III, Ivan V, and Peter I, in his first wedding, will all marry uh, in uh, largely abbreviated um, versions of the full-blown weddings that we have uh, going all the way back to 1500. Why? Well, for good reasons uh, that have everything to do with uh, who the groom was and with the underlying culture that supported the weddings. So in, in Fyodor III, of course, we had a very sickly uh, czar. Uh, he marries twice and he's actually dragged to his second wedding on a cot and dies shortly thereafter uh, because the need for successors was so great. Ivan V, of course, was mentally handicapped and Peter the Great was the very picture of health, uh, but he was in the middle of a dynastic dispute uh, with his half-sister uh, and the two branches of the dynasty uh, descended from um, Alexei Mikhailovich's two wives, which I'll get to in a moment. So for various reasons, uh, there were political and sort of health reasons to tone things down. And I also want to point out that the end of the 17th century, well, even before Peter the Great appears on the scene, we have a really a retooling of ritual. Peter the Great is often thought of as the great revolutionary and for good reason. But uh, the fact of the matter is that Peter's reforms exist in a context, one that reaches all the way back through the 17th century, in fact. Peter doesn't just plop out of nowhere. And uh, in fact, Peter's reforms, I would say, largely accelerate uh, 
rather than innovate uh, processes of change already happening in the 17th century, uh, which we might call the modern century. Peter himself, when he comes to the throne, he marries uh, in a uh, one of these uh, short and abbreviated weddings the first time. We know that he sent. We know that he sends his first wife off to uh, a monastery a convent uh, and marries again uh, Catherine. In that second marriage, he is um, really kind of rewriting the rule book for how weddings are happening. But during his reign, he actually has a number of opportunities to uh, marry off relatives. And on top of all of that, and himself, but on top of all of that, he choreographs these remarkable parodic weddings, parodies, jesters, dwarfs, um, old courtiers and young maidens to have a bit of fun. And that's been looked at in the past as kind of Peter just being uh, remarkably uh, boorish and uh, you know, the drunken synod and Peter's sort of disdain for tradition and uh, even religion. We don't think that anymore. We, we actually now know that every time Peter played a game, um, held a parodic audience or heavy drinking session, that he had serious politics on, in the, on the mind and um, that these changes actually were an important part of reestablishing, rebuilding uh, the monarchy around himself and his second wife and the children that they were having because there were, um, go, that's just a, an image of sort of how the, the second wedding of Peter's seating was arranged. You can notice the big tall um, wigs and so on, Western dress. And here is Michael Romanov's in 1625, a really very different kind of thing. What I want to suggest here in the last moments is that weddings become a key moment in the dispute between the two branches of the Romanov dynasty, the, the, the Milosavsky branch, which descends from uh, Maria Milosavska, first wife of Alexei Mikhailovich, and the, the, the Narishkin branch, which descends from Natalia Narishkina. That gives us Catherine the Great, Peter the Great, uh, Peter the Third, and all the rest, right? Um, each time, well, we know that the uh, 18th century was a time when the succession bounced back and forth between these two branches. After Peter's death, his wife takes over. Um, and uh, after her, Peter the third, Peter the second, excuse me, uh, takes over. But he then dies a young man on his wedding day, by the way. Uh, and we get Anna, who takes over who then wants to see her grand nephew take over. But Elizabeth has something to say about that. And then we get Peter the third and Catherine's, right? So we, the picture here is one of, of succession bouncing back and forth and back and forth, largely because Peter the Great had written a new law, perhaps you know, not really a new law, the first law of succession in Russian history that gave the emperor the right to pick his heir. So we know, this is old news, that the, the succession goes back and forth between the two branches. What is not so new is that each time it moved, there was a wedding. And the wedding was designed to produce heirs and successors to keep the succession in the branch that it was, uh, that the bride and groom were part of. So we have three weddings here, 15, 1725, marriage of Anna Petrovna and uh, Karl Friedrich of Holstein Glotter. We have Anna Leopoldovna in 1739 marrying Anton Orch. And we have Peter III and Catherine II, the future Peter III and Catherine II in 1745. And if you plot this out, what you see is that each one of these marriages uh, reorients the succession in their own branch. And what I've done was, is sort of draw this out. So we get Catherine the first, who wants to limit the succession to her descendants and Peter's descendants. And these, this branch over here is scratched out because they're actually limited from the succession. And the wedding that's key here um, is uh, th this marriage here, Anna and Carl Friedrich in 1725. In 1739, after Anna has already taken the throne because Peter II has died, 
she wants to keep the throne in her son. And she arranged for her niece to marry Anton Uruk. And as you can see, they have quite a large brood of children, including the very unfortunate Ivan VI. And these guys over here in this branch are out. And then finally, in 1745, where my study ends, we get Catherine the Great and Peter the Third getting married. And they, uh, producing Paul I, will try to eliminate the rest of these uh, descendants and, uh, of the Romanovs um, and lock the succession into the Narishkin branch of the dynasty, which succeeds. And it succeeds because uh, Paul will write a new law of succession, abrogating Peter the Great's law of succession, which will, uh, in many ways, kind of kickstart anew the Romanov dynasty. So all of this means that ritual and marriage, power, monarchy, and succession are really kind of facets of the same problem. And we have been, Swords have been exploring this problem for decades now. It is my contention that the best way to see how this how these facets all actually are connected is by looking at the thing that actually connects them when it, when it brought together a bride and a groom at a royal wedding. And that's my talk. We have a few fantastic questions already in the log. So Russell, again, thank you for this wonderful presentation. Uh, first question I'm going to ask, uh, one of our viewers is wondering how many of these traditions were church driven that would be for all Russians and how many of these were just for the royals or nobility? Yeah, it's a really great question. Um, the um, who borrows from whom? Do you, uh, the peasant weddings and merchant weddings um, urban versus rural weddings uh, look like, uh, for that matter, nobles' weddings. Do they look a lot like uh, the, the way that Tsars married? So the, the, that's a question that anthropologists in the 19th century and even in the 20th century, of course, in Soviet times, attempted to answer by going out into the regions and finding um, indigenous populations, the Komi or out in Siberia, um, and looking at how their wedding rites were were, uh, were performed and developing from that a kind of taxonomy of, of wedding rituals. And they found an, an awful lot of overlap, some, some unique features, but uh, they, they did a cross-sectional study. So they looked at the moment that they were in. They didn't really look at how these rites were rooted in the past. They made certain assumptions about uh, the antiquity of these rights. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of good reason to think that most of these rights are actually very, very old. But that is a conclusion not based on any kind of literary texts. Well, we have some tales, we have the Igor tale, we have some chronicle mentions. So we have little glimpses of, of rituals that still existed in the 17th century that seemed to have been performed, you know, in the 15th century or even the 12th century. So there's the suggestion that some of these rituals are very old, but we don't have any complete um, complete textual descriptions of them. So we're, we're guessing. We do have a text like the Damastroi, which you may have heard of, which is a, a, it's a, the text of the wedding is a, actually probably a 17th century text. The Damastroi itself comes out of Ivan Terrible's time in the middle of the 16th century. And it purports to describe the weddings of elites, not czars, but sort of rich, rich merchants and nobles. Uh, Katashikin, who's a, 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 um, a, a deserter, who was a clerk uh, in the chancelleries of the czars in the middle of the 17th century, wrote a description of boyar weddings. So we have some glimpses of non-royal weddings. And what we find is that most of what is in the royal weddings appear elsewhere too. There are some rituals that don't appear uh, in royal weddings. So uh, the shoeing ceremony is, is mentioned uh, 
for example, in the life of St. Alexander Nevsky, um, the, the metaphor of putting a shoe on your husband, groom, as a, as a way of indicating marriage is definitely documented, but it doesn't appear in any of the royal wedding texts of the 16th and 17th century. So it appears that some things came in and left and some things were uh, endured into the, into the modern period. But the answer to the question is we can really only describe nobles and czars. Everything below that, we have to rely on anthropological studies. And those are good. I certainly use them in my book. But I, I put a little asterisk next to them because I think we have to recognize their 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 limitations. And I and I do have to say that I I have um, I have real doubts about uh, some claims um, of the antiquity of these rites. So, for example, the bride show uh, clearly was borrowed in uh, 1505 at the suggestion of Greek itinerant Greek. Um, servitors from Byzantium who came to Moscow and brought with them lots of ideas about power and monarchy. And the bride show was one of them. So we don't have the bride show in ancient times, uh, but I think we do have some of the other wedding rituals in ancient times. It's a very good question. All right, thank you. If you wouldn't mind just going off of that thread a little bit further, a few of our participants actually are curious specifically about uh, bridal traditions and Byzantine traditions, uh, Sophia and Ivan III in particular. Uh, if you'd like to spend just a few more moments expanding upon that idea. So we think that uh, Sophia may be the first example of a bride getting a new name because she had the perfectly good Byzantine name Zoya, um, and she uh, comes and uh, we think probably she, there's there's the speculation that she had been uh, raised a Catholic, even though she was Greek. She was a ward of the Pope. She may have been Catholic. It's not known quite yet, but there's that speculation. And then when she either converts to Orthodoxy or comes to Moscow, she's given the name Sophia. So she's an example, first of many, um, of a bride taking on this new identity, uh, it, which is interesting because she's not low born. She's the niece of the last Byzantine emperor. We don't have actually a description of that wedding. Um, we, we don't know what rites were performed at it. Uh, at it. We have uh, a number of chronicle descriptions of it, but they're very thin, literally two or three lines. Uh, so we don't really, we can't really say the same kind of level of detail about it that we can say about, you know, Vas Vasily the Third, who was uh, Sophia and Ivan's son and successor. Uh, that wedding is actually really well documented. That wedding is the very first wedding we have. You know, interestingly about that though, the fifty, the very first, um, the very first muster that we have, fifteen hundred, Sophia was still alive. So was Ivan the Third, and their daughter gets married. And that muster is fascinating to me because at that time that the wedding was happening, there was a big feud in the family between who was, about who was going to succeed uh, Ivan III, <clears throat> his grandson um, by his first marriage or his son by his second, Sophia. <clears throat> and um, the wedding happens right in the middle of this still unresolved dispute. And what happens fascinatingly is that the text goes out of its way to say that the grandson's mother from the first marriage and Sophia Paleologa, the mother of the other candidate, the two mothers ride in the same carriage and are surrounded by their own retinues. That's not a ritual that happens at any other wedding. And the, the, I think the very clear reading of that is that this, this was a kind of ritual reconciliation. But the two women, the two women who are fighting each other, you know, almost literally, in the same carriage to broadcast the idea that we're fine now, we're playing nice now. And it was actually hoped that that dispute was going to peter out. It didn't. But the wedding happens at a, at a hopeful moment. So we can say something about Sophia's participation in weddings, but not her own. All right, thank you. Uh, another question here. What is a thousand man? Mm. 
Yeah, it's a very ancient title, goes back to Kievan times. It, it, it's a military term, uh, Chiliarch. Um, it's a, a military leader who's in charge of 100 men. There are also Sotniki, right, hundreds men. Uh, basically, you can think of them as modern, um, modern, um, well, ancient examples of modern uh, platoon commanders versus regimental commanders. It was a military title. What's interesting is that that title will continue to play a, a role as a military title, but will bleed over into the court. It will become a, a court rank. Uh, it then dies there too, it replaced with other titles and other functions. But in the, strictly speaking, the medieval period, this is a um, mostly a military leader that becomes a court figure as well. And what's interesting is that the title was kept even after there are no Tisitskis in Thousands Men um, really in the court anymore. So it's a really old title uh, that's an honorific, really. You give it to a very, very prominent member of either the dynasty or the very first ranking boyars. You're not someone low ranking and become a, a Thousand Men. You're someone very close to the dynasty. All right, another question specifically about the bride show itself. So when the czar went to the bride show, did he know in advance about what women would be there? Uh, was there any input on their end on which woman would be made available to him to marry? So we don't know what he knew. Um, we know that there, was, there were phases of the search. So the, the, one of the best bride shows documented is Ivan the Terrible, the one that gives us Anastasia Romanov as, uh, as his selection. Um, we have documents that show that uh, pairs of servitors, usually a boyar and a, and, a, and a clerk, were sent to various towns and they plopped themselves down and they issued an edict written by the czar, or nominally, and uh, all the the uh, gentrymen who had daughters of a certain age and qualification uh, were to bring them to the two men who were plopped down in that town. And then they were to write descriptions of each candidate and send it back to Moscow. And actually we have one, we have actually one of those, only one that exists from that particular wedding. It describes her, uh, it's a fascinating text. It describes her appearance. It, 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 uh, gives her medical history brief, it gives her parents medical history, and then the longest section is her genealogy. Not who she's descended from, not a vertical genealogy, but if she has siblings, who they're married to, who her uncles are married to and her aunts are married to. It's a kind of horizontal genealogy. And I don't think there's better evidence to be found that um, that marriage is about politics in this period because that bride, if you pick this woman and she comes to the bride show and she gets picked, uh, she's not coming alone. She's gonna bring her, her, uh, her brothers, her uncles and the women folk of her family. And they want to know who that's going to be. They wanna know if, if this is a good choice on that level. Um, so, that was done without the Tsar ever really knowing about it. These documents would come in and they would be handled whether he saw them or not. They vary from, the, from Tsar to Tsar. We have no way of knowing that. Uh, we do know this. We do know that there was a paring down section, uh, stages of paring down. There could be hundreds drawn in at these regional bride shows. Then you bring the winners to Moscow. They would be pared down again, this time usually by the boyars' wives during which time there would be some inspections of virtue, let's put it that way, of the bridal candidates uh, and more thorough investigations of their health histories. Uh, and then a even smaller group would be presented to the czar and he would be able to freely pick with one things from that group. So I showed you an image uh, from, from my book actually um, of uh, Alexei Mikhailovich picking his bride in 1648 that picture of the czar in front of all of these women. Uh, 
that were there were six women who were finalists. We know of more than 200, according to some foreigners reports, uh, that were involved in earlier stages. Uh, it, it appears that the Tsar had no role in those earlier pairings down, but he was presented with a group of women that he could that he could freely choose from. In other words, the finalists were women that the Tsar could pick any of these and everything would be okay from the Boyar's perspective. And if there was a candidate that would be a problem, she never made it in to the last few. Now, having said that, this is very interesting. There were times when the Tsar picked a bride from a, the final lineup that uh, who, who did have enemies. Um, Michael Romanov's first bride, for example, bride uh, selection in 1616, so eight years before he actually marries, uh, was a woman named Hopova who had the wrong relatives, it seems, and she was poisoned, not killed, but poisoned, throws up at a banquet and uh, sent her, her and her entire family into exile because it was presumed that she was concealing some uh, health issue. She wasn't. Uh, she was perfectly fine, lived a very long life in Siberia, very unfortunate. Uh, but there were, and Alexei Mikhailovich's first choice was, was also uh, poisoned and eliminated that way. There are other examples, and of course, Ivan and Terrible suspected several of his wives of being uh, poisoned. So this was high politics. There was nothing more important in Muscovy than the marriage of the Tsar. There was nothing more important because it determined who was going to be in the inner circle and who wasn't. And membership in the inner circle was kinship based, I, I would argue. You had to, there are exceptions, but for the most part, you had to somehow establish your place in the inner circle through kinship, horizontal kinship. So you could be married to someone who's married, someone who's married to someone. And that's just as good as being descended from someone. It's a really good question. All right, wonderful. So I'm going to leave things at a final question here with the disclaimer to everyone in the audience that if we did not yet answer your question, we have a uh, running repository of the log for today's event. So hopefully we can be in touch with you with a more substantiated answer. Thank you all for your participation so far. Uh, but the question I'm going to leave things off with here has to do a little bit with um, I guess, cultural transfusion of these rituals. Uh, the individual asks, what kind of education and training in court ritual did new Romanov brides receive during this period? Was there an equivalent in 16th and 17th century Russia to something like the Madame Etiquette at French court um, and people who are placed in charge of teaching individuals such as young Marie Antoinette about court etiquette at Versailles? Yeah, it's a really, interesting question because it gets us into the woman's experiences and perspectives on all of this. So easy to, to approach this topic from the man's side, isn't it? Because all the documents are oriented toward the, the, the groom because he's the czar or the or is a grand prince. Uh, when in fact, as I argue in the second book, uh, Weddings are actually far more um, transformative for brides um, than they are for, for grooms and every, on every single level. And in fact, the rituals make brides the center of attention from a ritual perspective. They are what uh, is, is happening. Um, they, they are the ones who give the gifts out. The couple doesn't receive gifts. The couple gives gifts and it's the bride who gives them. It's a way of building social solidarity when you think about it. Uh, she gives gifts off to uh, members of the, of the elite. The, the gifts have been handed to her from the, from the master workshops inside the Kremlin. They're not really hers, but she has to give them out. And that's, that, that's because she plays this fundamental role. She's a glue that holds the entire political system together. So it's good to be thinking about um, uh, here at the last question, thinking about how the bride uh, fits into all this. And, and of course, we have very little evidence of this. It is, however, instructive uh, to go back to something I pointed out earlier, which is that 
you never get in these bride shows. The daughter of a peasant. You never get the daughter of a priest. And you almost never get the daughter of a prince. What you get are the daughters of this very thin layer of regional gentry who, uh, who very much participate in the system of honor and precedence in Muscovy, which means that they're raising their daughters to know how to be properly Muscovite demure. They're, uh, they're trained at home on what is uh, the, the proper decorum for a woman of her station. Now, what happens when they arrive in Moscow, we have some hints, largely from foreigners' accounts, but we have some hints, that there's an additional um, process of instruction by the women of the court. Remember that women and men in Muscovy lived separate lives. There is female seclu seclusion in these centuries in Russia. Women lived in a parallel court called the Terum inside the Kremlin. And even um, in, the, in the countryside, if you were a gentryman, you would seclude your, your female kin, including your wife and your daughters, your sisters, they lived with you, in separate quarters so that men couldn't see them and interact with them. This was part of the notion of female and therefore family honor. But there were, of course, rules to learn, new rules to learn inside the Kremlin that were very different from life in the countryside. Who taught them? Well, we don't have any manuals. There are no, you know, no etiquette manuals from the time. Uh, who, who taught Marie Antoinette? Marie Antoinette was taught by the women folk of the court at Versailles. Same thing in Moscow. Uh, there are already women living in the tarim. And so when the bride-to-be is brought in during that entry ceremony, given a new name and a new title, her instruction begins. Um, and it's probably a lifetime instruction. Typically, she's brought in three days before, so she's not given a whole lot of time, and she'll go into the role. But it's informal, and it's guided by women folk. Actually, I should really say that women play an enormous role in bride selection and uh, the political system, both in terms of selecting brides, but also in terms of uh, matchmaking. Uh, we know that once the Tsar married a, a woman from a, from a gentry background, all of her sisters become the most marriageable people in this society because you want to become the in-law of the Tsar or the in-law of the in-law of the Tsar, right? So those sisters become immediately very popular. And who regulates that? Who knows the genealogies? Who knows the rules for consanguinity and how people are related to each other? They have it written down. They just know. The women of the court. So they're really running the show. And that's a really interesting question about which we only have some glimpses. All right, wonderful. So we'll stop things there for today's lecture. Uh, thank you again to everyone who participated, attended the event. Uh, one final thank you and round of applause virtually for Russell. I don't know if Zoom has that feature yet. They should add it. Mm -hmm. But uh, have a great weekend, everyone. And we will be in touch post-lecture with recording additional details for the audience. Bye, everyone. <laughs>